Okay, let's start. Uh, it's two minutes uh, past 11. So uh, I think, uh, think most should be able to have logged in by now. Uh, big welcome to our webinar today together with our friends from Churnt. Uh, we're very excited uh, for you all to be here. Uh, it's going to hopefully be a super cool webinar as well. Uh, just a few logistics or housekeeping points uh, for the webinar. Uh, it's going to be roughly 50, five zero minutes, uh, but it is only 20, 25 minutes of content. And the rest, we save some time for Q&A. So we also, you know, make sure we answer the questions you have. Uh, we're lots of people from all over the world, uh, which is super cool. Uh, so we also expect lots of questions during the webinar. So please uh, type your questions in either the Q&A or the uh, chat. Uh, we'll make sure we see them. And we try to answer all of them, of course, as well. Um, good to know that this webinar is also recorded. So if you need to, you know, pick up your kids uh, from the dry cleaning, <laughs> whatever you have uh, midway, uh, make sure the rest, you can watch it back later. Uh, and then you will see it uh, in the recording. Also, the same goes for the presentation that we have on the screen uh, will also be shared with you all today. Um, I think we have some... Uh, Cool people today, we have Linda from Unium, Linda Berg, our uh, customer success manager, uh, but she will do a much better job at introducing herself further in this presentation. And of course, uh, Marta uh, from Churnt, who is going to explain how AI is, you know, increasing your odds of renewals and, you know, getting much more money from the existing customers, which is which is cool. Uh, and I'm Walter. I'm just here for, uh, you know, the startup and the host uh, of the show. And at the end, I will uh, be included in the uh, Q&A part to answer some questions that you have. Um, moving on, uh, so what this webinar is going to be about is the introduction, which we partly did, uh, but we also introduced Churnt, uh, Marta, Linda and Unium a bit. Then uh, Marta is going to take us through, uh, you know, how understanding Churn. There's lots of, you know, people that say something different about Churn, so we're going to go through the foundation of it. And also how AI uh, really helps predict Churn and therefore keep money on, in the pocket. And then uh, Linda is going to tell us about how uh, running subscription management programs within the base really actually actively helps to avoid churn uh, and also gives a, a sneak peek on how we do it internally at Juni uh, churn prevention program. So that's uh, hopefully gives you some practical tips. Uh, as mentioned, uh, at the end, we're going to close off with the Q&A. So you'll get lots of room uh, to answer your own or ask your own questions, which we will then answer at the end. Uh, and then we, we summarize the presentation. And like I said, all of that will be roughly about 50 minutes. So without further ado, I think, Mart, I'm handing over to you now, right? Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Mart Dornebal. I'm one of the founders of Churnt. Churnt is a customer success management retention management platform founded in 2019 by a professor in data science, his former student, which is also my brother and myself. I'm heading the commercial operations of Churn. Um, we're an international company based in Amsterdam. And how we are different from most other customer success management platforms is that we use AI to predict customer health and all the actions that are there to increase health. Uh, whereas most customer success platforms are rule-based. And by the way we do it, we uh, bridge the gap between AI and customer success management, transforming your data into all kinds of predictions and actions that will help you with portfolio management, ultimately to prevent customer churn from happening and increasing customer lifetime value. So that's uh, that's basically about, uh, about me and about us. So Linda, over to you, I think. Yes, so hi, nice to meet all of you. My name is Linda Berg and I work, work as a customer success manager here at Unium. Uh, Unium is the subscription hub for uh, business to business companies and our aim is to streamline the subscription management, the invoicing and billing, financial reporting, and by doing that, get better data insights. Uh, we're enabling growing businesses to have full control of subscriptions and more easily implement scalable processes. And by that also harness more accurate metrics, meaning that our customers spend less time on manual administration and they never miss an opportunity to secure revenue. Well, uh, Union was founded 2017 by our CEO, Nicholas Lilla, who recently moved to Philadelphia uh, to open up a new office. And besides that, we also have offices in Stockholm, Malmö, Krakow, and Amsterdam. And we have over 140 international customers. Uh, we're growing really much in many countries, and we have entered many new markets. And therefore, we have the strong geographical growth. 
Uh, and our positive net revenue retention is that we have our churn and customer success programs that let us grow even more revenue on existing customer base. Um, yes, so that was. Yeah, so thanks. Um, let's start with a word that can be a bit scary for subscription businesses, and that is the word churn. But to really understand it, let's look at what churn means and also how it shows up in its different ways. So churn refers to the rate at which customers cancel their contract or stop doing business with you. And there are multiple types of churn where we use the, the two main types, customer churn, that is what the percentage of customers that cancel their subscriptions. And second, we have revenue churn and revenue churn is the percentage of revenue that you lose because of cancellations or downgrades. Then it's also important to distinguish between voluntary churn and involuntary churn, where voluntary churn is where a customer actively decides to leave. And involuntary churn is where customers leave because of reasons that are not really within their control. Um, we focus mainly on voluntary churn. That is the, the type of churn that you can often influence, where involuntary churn is more difficult to handle. Um, yeah, then what is the effect of churn on a business? Obviously, it has bad effects on the company, for example, harming the, the reputation of the company, but also financially, especially during economic downturns, uh, it's more difficult to acquire a customer. So customer acquisitions costs are generally higher. Uh, and now it's even more important for businesses to maintain a, uh, a stable revenue stream. Um, and because of that, not surprisingly, uh, yeah, customer churn and also NRR or net revenue retention are becoming the most important uh, metrics in, uh, in boardrooms. So understanding and dealing with churn is very important for SaaS companies. And in the next slide, Volper goes to the next one, I will explain some uh, yeah, reasons for churn. So um, yeah, there are reasons that you will see at practically every business. So as high pricing, perceived lack of value, a bad customer support. And we have uh, reasons that are very specific for SaaS such as long time to value, poor onboarding, low product usage, or complex pricing. And yeah, of course, as a company, you want to deal with these churn reasons. There are multiple ways how to deal with those. For example, if we look at the uh, B2B SaaS or the, the SaaS-specific churn reasons like complex pricing, you have subscription management tools like Unium that you can utilize to provide flexible billing options and thus reduce churn, which Linda will probably tell more about in a bit. And then we have uh, low product usage. This is a very important predictor of churn. That's what we see, but also what's confirmed by research. And also there you have ways to deal with this. For example, through proactive customer success management, um, where you, by timely signaling uh, the issue, for example, through a customer success tool that can identify usage patterns, the, pro the customer success manager can proactively engage with the customer to get them using the product again. And that is the part where I will focus on uh, from the next slide, where we dive a little bit deeper in how customer success management and specifically how AI within customer success management can help companies um, deal with these churn reasons. So as a customer success manager, your main goal is to get your customers get the most value of the product or service that they're using. And in order to be able to help them in the right way, um, it is very important to make use of the data that you have of your customers because the data tells a lot about their health, their needs, their behavior. And uh, so then you, of course, have to translate that data into some kind of score or action that you can use as a customer success manager, which is not an uh, easy exercise. And that is why many companies use a customer success platform because it helps you translate your customer data into these actions and scores. And uh, there we have two types of customer success methods, let's say, or methods to uh, uh, translate these actions or data into actions. And there are the rule-based method and an AI-based method. And let's compare a bit uh, both methods. So uh, yeah, we understand how AI is different. So on the left, we have the rule-based uh, customer success approach, which is used by most current customer success platforms. And in a rule-based approach, you conditionally process the data that you have in the systems to a set of mostly human created rules that then lead to a score or an action. So you as a customer success manager set up some if X, then Y statements. Like if a customer doesn't log in 10 times a day, he's at risk. If um, this many support tickets are created, the customer is at risk. Um, so, and there you use data from systems like your HubSpot, your Mixpanel, your Fastdesk, so the, the CRM support usage type of data sources 
to the, the human rules, and then you get actions. And while these rule-based systems can definitely work, there are also limitations because uh, it, it, the, the rules are often created by a human. So you really rely on the capability of the human or maybe the gut feeling of the human to uh, set up the right rules, which is not an easy exercise either. Um, and also maintaining those rules is also a difficult exercise because if anything changes to your product, you release a new feature, your pricing changes, the rules are not in sync anymore and they have to be updated and adjusted, which costs time and resources. Uh, then uh, rule-based systems generally struggle with exceptions. And the reality is, unfortunately, that clients don't behave the same. Um, and since uh, in the rules, you only use, the, you only capture the data that is used in the rules. You often only use a fraction of the data that you have available in the systems. Research even showing that it's often only 1%. And that can lead to blind spots or inaccurate predictions. So then we have the AI-based method on the right. And the AI-based method, uh, just like a rule-based, you use the data that you have in the systems, you integrate it into the AI, but there you don't set up the rules, but you the AI uh, does the work for you. It trains on the data that you have in the systems. So uh, you, you use the same CRM support and usage data. What the AI model does, it looks at who churned in the past and what did we see prior happening to that moment. So it uses historic data to predict with very little or a human uh, uh, or without any human intervention. Um, and because of that, it can also overcome some of the limitations. For example, uh, so it, it uses all the data that you have in the system leading to more accurate predictions. It is very good capable of uh, dealing with complex relationships. And therefore also it, it works very well with the exceptions and the edge cases. And um, a big advantage is once it's set up, it's quite easy to maintain since there are no rules that have to be created or updated. It actually learns its self-learning and learns over time, hey, machine learning, um, and improves on its uh, actions and predictions. So in the next slide, we'll look a little bit deeper in how AI is actually good in predicting risks. So um, as said, AI uses more data points and because of that, it's capable of dealing with the more complex relations and exceptions. And unlike rule-based systems that apply roughly the same um, standards to all customers, the AI adapts to the unique patterns of a specific customer. For example, in customer A, 100 times logging in per day can be healthy, while for customer B, 10 times logging in per day means healthy. So every customer is different. And if the system would not understand or would not recognize this, it will come up with wrong health scores and that can even lead to wrong actions to be triggered. So if we look at the example in the slide, um, suppose we have two customers, we have Adobe and Microsoft, and last month they've been following exactly the same journey. They have the same uh, behavior, the same numbers, they both received an email, they logged in, they had a support call, uh, but still the AI predicted a very different health score. And that is exactly where AI is good at. It's very capable of spotting and understanding uh, the differences in the expected individual behavior and then automatically recognizing them as unusual. So for Adobe, um, interacting less with the product, uh, taking fewer meetings, making fewer calls were risk drivers. For Microsoft, this led to a completely different risk score. So the power of AI in customer success is that it enables us to personalize insights for each customer. It detects very subtle changes and because of that, it might signal a churn risk. So having identified who is at risk, then the next step, of course, is how to deal with this risk. And if we can go to the, yeah, perfect. So um, the AI is, first of all, of course, very good in predicting risk, um, but it's also very good in predicting the next best action. So what should Adobe do to prevent churn from happening? And the beauty of AI is that it doesn't stop here, but it actually learns from every action that you take and it also measures what was the impact of that action on, on the health. So in this example, we've seen Adobe, uh, they got a warning flag. So there was, uh, they, there was usage, there was a pattern that showed that they were at risk. And then the AI predicted the next best action for Adobe to prevent or to reduce the churn risk is to send an automated onboarding video. So that action was triggered. So they received an automated onboarding video per email. And that action is then a new data point, which is fed back into the models. And then the models measure what was the effect of this action on risk. And for example, product usage was a 
uh, churn driver here. So the models, for example, would measure what was the effect. So what did we see after sending this onboarding video happening in the usage? So did it was the predicted impact versus what was the actual uh, impact? And then it learns from that action and also updates the next best action based on those learnings. So in this example, um, yeah, the models me measured the impact and the risk stayed practically the same. And based on these learnings or learnings from other customers or uh, of the past, a different next best action was recommended. And in this case, that was a customer success goal. So the continuous learning allows AI to refine its next best actions, making them smarter and better and more personalized with each interaction. So that was a, uh, a take on AI and customer success. Um, I think Linda will now tell you more about her Unium customer success journey and the use of subscription billing tools to register. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so I will jump to the boring part straight away. And this is uh, a few reasons why churn can happen due to poor subscription handling. So one is that the customer gets the wrong invoice, maybe one time, maybe a few times. Nevertheless, customers tend not to like that if the first invoice they get is too early or too faulty, that often leads to a bad start of the relationship. Or maybe that you lack visibility in renewal management. Maybe you didn't leave enough time between the renewal coming up and the customer touch point simply because you didn't know it was coming up. Or perhaps that the customer ordered an add-on, but the process didn't go through and the access wasn't given. Not only do you lose money from not charging directly, but if this happens enough, customers will churn. So instead of churn, our first do is to increase the renewal likeliness. We need to focus on getting the highest renewal rates possible. So four tips to do that. Stay ahead. Don't start talking to your customers when the renewal is just around the corner. Be ahead of the game. And also monitor their behavior. Watch competitors and be mindful about what your competitors do. Be aware of pricing changes in the market because even when your customers are happy, they care about money too. And if they don't see or get the value with you, they will start to look elsewhere. Last but not least, uh, it's really about to focus your efforts. When you have gauged the happiness of your customers, then focus your energy on the highest risk and the highest ACV. And one good thing about these four tips is that uh, they don't require any expensive tools or something like that, but it does require a great customer success team. So, <clears throat> To grow revenue during renewals, it is crucial. And one fun fact is that according to many research studies, an average SaaS company grows 16% of their annual contract value simply by upselling to existing customers, which is quite an amazing growth on customers you already have. So how can you grow revenue on renewals? First off, by talking about your product, what's new in the product, educate your customers, what can they apply to their businesses and so on, monetize modules, new integrations, etc. cetera. Um, the next thing is indexation. For sure you'll have it in the agreement already, but don't forget to actually add it. Many customers forget to add it due to manual work in a spreadsheet or they might get the wrong percentage. But by skipping the spreadsheet and add it directly in your subscription system, you will probably never miss out again. And this is a great way to grow revenue if you manage it properly. And also, here again, what happened in the market? Make sure you perform, perform market research. And here we're coming back to your com competitors. Be aware of what they are up to. Let's say they are changing their price models. For example, if you know this before meeting with the customer or a prospect, then you know that maybe price will be an issue or at least come up to discussion. Uh, also, if they have features that you don't, but maybe are about to build, it's important to let your customers know and maybe also have a roadmap ready for that. Uh, least but not last, to turn your customers into advocates. Don't be afraid to ask your customers to be references. If they are happy with you, and what you provide, then they will say yes. And also maybe reward them for this 
this is something that you could actually agree upon in the beginning of your cooperation as well. <clears throat> and so streamline and automate the quota order flow through integration. This leads us back to the first topic on how to avoid churn by having the invoice correct right away. So a great way to start is by implementing a subscription management hub that also talks to other tools in the quota order process, uh, such as the finance and accounting systems, CRM systems, among many others. And to start a quote the process, you typically create quotes following a dialogue with customers, which we then have in our CRM system with all the information you might need, such as contact and which product they will be using at certain price points, for example. And depending on which system you use, you then create the quote. And when the quote is won and the CRM is linked to subscription hub, finance automatically trigger all the relevant information. And if finance agrees, they can simply turn the signed quote into a running subscription. Or if there was something missing, you still have the time to contact your customer and get, for example, the missing invoice email address. But if all good, then the invoice can be sent out and you will have all the metrics that you might need and the revenue results collected in one place. <clears throat> so how do we work to counteract churn? Well, Nobody likes to be surprised with a churn. And uh, to prevent that at Unium, we keep track on uh, the product usage. One thing that I think is a pretty good sign that our customer is happy is that they use the platform. So if possible to track this, then you should. At Unium, we have built an integration to start deliver where we can see our customer's usage. So for example, since we have a platform for billing, and if we then see that our customer uh, isn't billing their end customers, we need to reach out to them and see why. Or if they do create a lot of invoices, but then cancel them, we must try and address them and be proactive to see if they maybe need more training or is it a new user or what's causing it, the canceled invoice uh, and help them to solve it. And then we come to the QBRs uh, or business reviews. Business reviews isn't maybe mandatory to have quarterly with all of your customers, but with that said, you still need to have them. Partly to clarify how the customer is in a relation to the goals that you set together at the beginning of the collaboration. But it's also a good way to capture how the customer is feeling beyond what can be read in the actual data. And also one thing to touch upon in the business reviews is the embassy for using that. For us, it works in different ways. We need to identify who it is. With that said, of course, all NPS scores are valuable and we need them. But let's say it's bad rating from one in their sales team. Then we can analyze that in one way. And if it's from one of our stakeholders, we analyze that in another way. Because if you take your NPS as is and just work from, from that, it might be deceptive especially if you have a lot of different users, such as super users, stakeholders, and sales. Besides the QBRs, we also have the renewal and upsell talks. You can, of course, add them to the above as well, but you can have them separately. And if you have them separately, take the opportunity to build a relationship even tighter with your customer when talking with them about their upcoming renewal. And with the upsell, we have the same opportunity, not only to retain your customer, but also engage them to work even closer with you. But one of our most critical and important driving factor is the time to value. If the customers do not get value quickly and see a profit on the product, then the risk of churn at the first renewal is quite high. But if you then deliver value quickly and make sure that the customer is happy and continues to be by, for example, having the QBRs or reach out when given an NPS, that shows that you care and work to keep them long term. So it is important to always create value for your customers. That is the best way to keep them engaged and satisfied on the long term run. So with the 
the above said from union side, I would recommend you to implement the renewal management that allows having conversations at the right time and shores up sell opportunities and increases CLTV and NRR rather than cost churn. But also to streamline your quote to order process, integrating and automating your quote to order processes with a single source of truth ensures that customers always get the invoice they expect. Then from churn, um, yeah, I explained all the, the advantages of AI. So I would say utilize AI to predict and prevent customer churn, understand customer behavior, and use uh, proactive customer success management to deal with the, the at-risk clients and adopt a self-learning system, uh, turning every customer interaction that you have with a learning moment and getting smarter over time with better actions. Um, so yeah, that was that were the conclusions from uh, from us. I think now, Walter, it's time for yeah. the Q and A. Time for the Q and A. Thank you guys so much, Linda and Marta. Uh, it was really great. Uh, especially AI, it's such a trending topic in general, but uh, it's it's always hard to make it tangible and practical, right? Like it's cool to talk about ChatGPT and then actually see a solution that really. Uh, drives it and, and knows how to put it in practice is, is always awesome. So uh, really inspired by the talk and, uh, and I hope uh, all, all liked it as well. Uh, so as, as we said, we have uh, room for the Q&A now. Uh, so I, I do see a few questions here. So I need to uh, do a bit of uh, switching the screens, uh, but um, yeah, let's, let's take a few. Um, I got one question here. Can I integrate Unium with Churned? Is there an integration between Churnt and Union Marta? Uh, that's probably the best if you take that. Yeah, yeah. So indeed, there is an integration between Union and Churnt. So Churnt uses, uh, yeah, data from external systems uh, uh, to to predict behavior. One of those systems is Union. Uh, if you look on our website, you will see a list of integrations. Union is there. So actually, we have some shared clients. And uh, yeah, we use Union, so we get the the subscription data, booking data, order data, that type of data out of Union and uh, use that in the predictions. Cool, that's very good. And then we have another question. Unium has 135 customers and, the, oh, it's uh, chatting, uh, sorry. Uh, and the number of customers who would have churn must have been a few. Now, as at Union, we don't really know. That's why we invited Mart. We don't know what churn is, so we, we never had it before. No, I'm kidding. Uh, of course, we had a few churns. Do you think the small sample size must be impacting the churn prediction accuracy? I think Marta, sorry, I'm again throwing that over to you. It's okay. No, that's, uh, that's no problem. Um, so obviously, the more data, the better for, uh, for a model to predict well. So you need some training data. So you need to have a, had a couple of churners to be able to predict churn well. Um, but it is it is not the case that uh, so there you have companies that have we have com customers that have about hundred clients but they have very rich data sets so, so they track practically every click that a user did in the system so they track a lot of data over time whereas you also have com companies with ten thousand uh, clients that don't track usage data don't uh, yeah so it just really depends on the 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 type of data and the richness of the data in the systems. Uh, but indeed, it is uh, better to have had churn in the past, so the models can use those uh, churners to to train the uh, to uh, to train on. Um, still, you can also use proxies uh, for that. But yes, it does impact the the accuracy. Yeah. Cool. Uh, now we have a question for both of us. Uh, so uh, someone asks: Is it possible to show information or results from churn and union? back into the CRM system, like renewal days or customer customer health scores. So I'll answer the union part. Uh, yes, we do synchronize back the subscription information, uh, but also things like what did we invoice? Uh, what was the amount? What is the payment status? So we, we synchronize a lot with our HubSpot or any other CRM practically. Uh, and then uh, on the customer health scores, Martin, do you sync that back to uh, HubSpot? Yeah, yeah. So that is uh, actually also one of our, uh, uh, let's say, uh, offerings is that we have two-way integration with most CRMs so that uh, indeed uh, HubSpot we feed back with a churn prediction, warning flags, churn drivers, next best actions. And we also uh, feed workflows uh, with, with these actions and predictions to automate, um, uh, yeah, let's have more the tech touch follow-up for yeah. the, the low-value customers, for example, through HubSpot. Yes. Exactly. 
Um, then there's a question. Does Unim have churn reports as well? Uh, yes. Uh, so Unim has uh, revenue churn reports. Uh, but, you know, of course, Unim reports churn when it happened, uh, right? So if you want those reports to be empty, you need to call Marta. Uh, <laughs> and, but we present, you know, uh, we report it based on the booking, which means like if a subscription gets canceled, it's a churn or when there's a partial cancellation. So customer cancels an add-on, then you also see partial cancellations on booking reports as well. Uh, but like I said, if you want them to be empty, uh, call Marta. Um, uh, do you have an integration with Gainsight? Uh, so uh, I'm totally blanking on this. I don't know what Gainsight is. Uh, so sorry about that. Marta, do you have it? <laughs> yeah, no, so we don't have it. Gainsight is a, uh, let's say, the founding father of customer success. Uh, okay. It's a big American ah, yeah. customer success platform, rule-based though. Uh, we don't have a um, integration with them, uh, but that could be something for the future. So actually, it's you can say it's somehow it's a competitor. We don't focus on the same type of customers, and they have a different method. So we are very different. But uh, yeah, we are both customer success tools. So uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, then I got a question: Is there any AI built-in feature in Unium? uh this is again where that ai comes i don't think we have actual ai i think we have learnings uh and then we apply learnings in, in the solution but to call it ai would be a bit uh bragging uh, without it proving it so we have AI or analytics on usage so we spot trends like how much is your customer you know doing on usage-based uh, information so if they have a usage-based product where they pay as they go we have some trends in the revenue there and there's a few other things but we we have more on the roadmap but that's more related to ux like, you know, if you if we see you um, create a manual invoice three times that we say, hey, you know, you can do this in bulk, right? Uh, those kind of things uh, is, is more on the roadmap. But that's, so that's really on the UX level. Uh, so to answer that, and then let's see. Um, does churn also, uh, churned, sorry, Marta, uh, does churn also predict a partial churn as in like, you know, they're using a module less or more or... Um, because of low adoption, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, yes, so basically what the, the models in the AI engine do, they predict, so we have an event and what the model does, it looks at what happened prior to that event. So it can be churn, it can be upsell, it can be reactivation, it can be churn of a feature. So then it would be, uh, okay, feature X churned, but uh, there was churn on that feature. What did we see in behavior or what did we, did we see in the characteristics of the customers that churned that feature? Um, and, and for a model, it's just uh, changing the dependent variable, not much uh, different than predicting a full churn. So yes. Okay, very good. Uh, how much historic data do you need to be able, do you need to have in order for churn to become like relevant in the application landscape? Do you need like lots of data to put in the AI from scratch or like how does that work? Um, that, that works a bit the same as the, the question that uh, Manhar asked about the number of customers. Is okay. the sample size of Unium uh, big enough? So basically, um, it depends on the, the richness of the data uh, and the, the volumes. So I would say um, if you have a rich data set, you would say uh, six months is what you want, at least, maybe. Of course, uh, again, it's very difficult to put a number on it because it really depends on, the, on the, what, what you have stored in the systems. But I would say uh, at least six months of uh, historic data. Okay. Um, maybe also to, if you're not sure if the quality uh, of the data is good, we also backtest on the data. And what does it mean is that, let's say you have three years of data, you give us three years of data, but not the last six months. And then what we do is that we predict what happened in January, February, March, April, and then we compare it with the actuals. And then we can put a number on the accuracy of our predictions. So um, uh, that's, uh, if you have a question, hey, my, my data set, is it good enough? That is a way also to, to cope with that uncertainty. Cool. Uh, a few more questions for you, Marty. You're super popular today. Uh, what's the confidence level for AI-based churn prediction? Wow, that's a cool question. What is the confidence level? Yeah. Um, so, and, and, and what is exactly, the, so for predicting, so what is the, 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 the minimum, let's say the, the significance level you want to be able to, so we put a risk score on a customer and mm -hmm. you can, of course, it, 
uh, the, uh, how well we are able to predict churn also, of course, depends on the confidence level that or the significance level that you put on it. Um, I, I would not say there is one. I, I would I'm not able to give that answer. Like if there's an absolute number for that, but uh, yeah, if you play, yeah, with is that, it like course, uh, maybe is is it maybe honey here means uh, like is that like okay if if churn says churn says okay there's 80 percent chance of this customer churning as an example due to x um how good is that 80 percent uh like is that also 80 percent chance that it's 80 percent chance of the customer is, is that maybe like a can you give an indication of that or is that really hard yeah i think that's 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 hard uh yeah. to do indeed the, yeah. the benefit is of course because it's ai it will the percentage of prediction will become better and better, right? Because it keeps on learning and-, and uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you have a very technical question, I would, uh, we can always set up a meeting with one of my technical colleagues because I'm one of the few people in the company that does not have a technical background, so. Uh. <laughs> but I did I did hear you say at the beginning that you have a commercial, that you run the commercial operations. So the, here's a commercial question. Uh, so there's someone saying, I haven't had a chance to use churn so far, but you got me really as interested in presenting this to my company. Could you point out some advantages compared to other AI customer success management platforms like Churn Zero? Um, so as far as I know, Churn Zero is a rule-based customer success platform that incorporated ChatGPT as some kind of assistant. Um, so yeah, is that a real AI customer success management platform? I don't think so. I think they, uh, so if you uh, incorporate the, the chat functionality of ChatGPT in your tool, are you then AI? No. So they, they predict health based on rules and then they use this uh, uh, external tool to help you with, okay, what is the best email I can write now to a customer? Um, so that's what they do, but I don't think that's, uh, I would not say they can label themselves as an AI company, uh, to be honest. Okay. Um, so you see yourselves as the best winning AI CS <laughs> platform. That's nah. good. I cannot say that, but uh, no, you cannot say it, but you think uh, it, and that's fine. <laughs> I'll say it for you. <laughs> Thanks. So um, does churn also advise AI based on winning back a customer? So if you know it did happen, uh, do you make recommendations on you can fix it like this? Or yeah, yeah. So that's exactly with the partial churn. So we have an event. Uh, so the event can be uh, reactivation. So of the customers that have been reactivated, what did we see in the behavior and the characteristics? What actions led to reactivation? So uh, that's basically what the model do. You set a, a dependent variable and it checks or from that what happened in the past. What did what are the uh, what can we predict based on that for the current customers? So yes, uh, you can use it for re reactivation, for upsell, for churn, for partial churn. Or a dropping usage. Cool. That's very good. Uh, we got another union question. Happy with that. Uh, so we heard you say HubSpot and Salesforce CRM integrations to union. Do you also support Microsoft Business Central uh, CRM? Yes. Uh, we have uh, we have an integration to that as well. Uh, and then another one for churned. Uh, so we we are not really proud of the existing data, and they always say garbage in is garbage out. Uh, how does your AI work with uh, bad data? Um, yeah, so yeah, I think it's a utopia to say that uh, that you need a, a perfect data set to be able to predict well. So I think most customers have issues with their data somewhere, but that doesn't mean that it's not good enough uh, to do anything with it. Um, and as said, so the, our platform has data, automatic data cleaning functionalities. Uh, we also enrich the data, by the way. And, uh, and as said, so the back testing is a way to, uh, yeah, to check the quality of your data before, uh, yeah, putting all your automations uh, on it. So there are methods to to cope with it. But of course, uh, the better the data, the better the predictions. That is uh, that's clear. Okay, uh, another one for you, Marta. Sorry, you're very busy. Yeah. Uh, no, you get paid by the hour. Uh, <laughs> is is there an average percentage of churn reduction when working with your solution? So do you present kind of like an ROI business case when speaking to prospects? Like, you know, you're going to pay millions of euros for a solution. No, but uh, there is there like an ROI you have in mind? Uh, um, so, of course, that also depends on the company. Uh, it depends on multiple things like... Uh, 
uh, the, for example, it can be data quality, but especially also how mature is the customer success organization. So we have examples that we see that someone, uh, a company did practically nothing on customer success. Yeah, then it's quite easy to make impact with all the predictions and actions. If you are a very mature uh, organization with very few enterprise customers that you are in daily contact with, maybe then it's more difficult to get very extreme uh, uh, results. But to give a number, I would say between 15 and 30 percent is what we at least aim for. Okay. Reduction, reduction, relative reduction. Cool. Um, we we heard you. Sorry, another question, but that's for for both of us, I think. Uh, we heard you say usage a couple of times. We have a pay-as-you-go model uh, for customers, so they have a certain number of usage within the bundle and. And uh, outside the bundle, how does Union deal with that? And does churn do anything with the usage quantity? So uh, to answer on behalf of Union, uh, yeah. So the, we, we can either connect via an API so that the actual usage comes in. In the subscription itself, it says with this customer, it has been agreed they had access to 1,000 API calls or 500 bananas or whatever you measure, right? Uh, and that can go in via, uh, via API. Or uh, if you don't have that in your existing, you know, environment, you can uh, import that via CSV. And then, like I said, if you import the actual quantity in whatever way, it knows, okay, customer had access to this. So you need to send an additional invoice for this tier or that tier or depending, you know, on the agreement. Um, and then on the usage data in churn, uh, can you elaborate a bit on that, Marta? Uh, yeah, so usage data is one of the most important predictors. So we, if, if it's available, we always uh, include it in the predictions. So it can either be through a tool like Mixpanel uh, or uh, if it's uh, in a uh, cloud data warehouse stored, uh, then we uh, have to map it once uh, from there. But yes, usage data is always used for sure. Mm -hmm. um, has this is fun? Has churn become a more important metric uh, given the economic situation we had? Uh, I think uh, for me, uh, yeah. I think uh, absolutely. On behalf of Unium, yes. Uh, I think you know. Um, it's it's tougher to get new customers in for a lot of companies and i think i hope uh, at least we do see a, a good uptrend again like it's, it's not as bad as it looked uh this time last year uh in my humble opinion but um so uh, you know with a, a slower inflow of new customers uh, keeping the back door shut is 10 times as important i would say so absolutely investors will look at that as well uh and any maybe private equity that wants to uh take over uh but but do you see that as well marta how did churn perform in this you know economic decline or downturn whatever we call it um yeah so i think just like what you said we also notice when i'm in uh, commercial meetings with companies it is clear that it's a very important kpi for most companies we actually also had indeed uh, um, uh, we have customers that are backed by private equity companies that also almost forced the companies to use their a tool for churn so uh, yes, I also noticed that it's uh, becoming more important. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm checking, but I think we answered all the questions. I'm going to give it you know, a few more seconds here. Uh, there are a lot of questions, everyone. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, no, looks to be good. Um, then, you know, um, if if you have a question that pops in your head, of course, after the webinar, uh, I think there's some, uh, we can put our links or but you see also the email addresses of us in the uh, in the sheet here on screen. So you can just uh, copy paste and, uh, and, and, and write us a message. If you have a, one more question, uh, just, just reach out. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you for being here with us. Uh, we hope you had a good time and learned something practical uh, that you can apply today. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you. Bye.